Our second scripture reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. And let me apologize in advance because I may have failed to switch it back to the one that you guys use. So words might be a little different. I'll try to remember in the future to be better about it. But hear the word of the Lord. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good that we are here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. And then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless, and at the time told no one what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those who were paying attention, you might have realized that these are two different tellings of the same exact story. The transfiguration of Jesus. And they tell the same story, but with one or more fewer, one more or fewer details, depending on the gospel writer, and with slightly different explanations of the reactions of those involved. There's also another version of this story in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, which is almost word for word the same as Mark's. And there's a reference to the story in 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. It's a pivotal moment in the life of Jesus, and it marks a major transition in his early ministry. The transfiguration is a big deal. And as time goes on, the reports of the event, like those for any major event, change more to references than reports because the event becomes part of people's consciousness. If you think about major past events and you think about them in today, you don't need to go into a detailed explanation for people to have an idea of what you mean. When somebody says something about Pearl Harbor, you don't need an explanation. Or the assassination of Kennedy, or the fall of Saigon, or the blizzard of 1978, or the LA riots, or 9-11, or any number of events that we know about. They were all pivotal in some way. They're all part of our collective memory, even if only through old news and mo news reports and movies. But people tend to remember where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news of these things. In some ways, time is even measured by them. And such was the case with transfiguration for the early believers. By the time we get to 2 Peter, the incident is so well known it just kind of gets a passing mention because everybody knows what he's talking about. They understood that the truth of what the apostles were saying about Christ's return and they understood it as a support for a call to Christian living. Now this particular story is often kind of overlooked by modern believers who have focused their attention on the bigger events of Christ's life, measuring time by his birth and his baptism, Passion Week, his resurrection, his ascension. But back in the day, this was a major big deal. And it is still one of the days that marks the Christian year in terms of liturgical stuff. So why are there different stories? Why do Matthew and Mark place it six days after Jesus told the disciples about his impending death, and Luke places it eight days later? Why does Luke have so much more detail than Matthew and Mark? And, and why do both Matthew and John mention fear among the disciples while well, Luke says they were nearly asleep? And do the minor differences really matter in our understanding and acceptance of the story?
Part of the difference comes from the way that different news outlets give different details about particular stories. Some news outlets even use that different perspective as a focus of their advertising. For example, if you have Spectrum News, you, you have that focus of the weather on the ones. And WROC uses the tagline, Rochester first. And in both cases, the news and weather you get really is a lot more local. And you'll get much more detail on local stories than you would if you watched one of the big cable networks or one of the major broadcast networks. And the geographical source of news makes a difference too. If a person from, let's say, New York City is asked about the 1986 World Series, he or she is likely to have a somewhat different perspective than a person from Boston. The New Yorker is likely to consider it one of the greatest victories, while the Boston person considers it a terrible defeat. And we all know that cable news outlets have different political perspectives that they favor and that their coverage is influenced by these perspectives. Well, the same was true for the gospel writers. They had different perspectives, and it makes a difference in how they report. Matthew and Mark knew Jesus. They knew him personally. They walked around with him. They shared meals with him. They traveled together. They would have had the details of the transfiguration directly from those who witnessed it, and they might not have felt the need to talk about all the little details because, well, y'all heard that when, you know, James and John were talking about it, right? So I, I don't have to go into all that. Luke, who was Paul's physician, wrote significantly later, Luke never met Jesus in person in this lifetime, and he would have gathered all the details from other people, second or even third hand. And being a newer convert, and eager to learn and record everything, he included information that Matthew and Mark might have assumed was either unimportant or self-evident. Matthew and Mark were close friends of Peter, James, and John who went up the mountain with Jesus. They might have remembered people's facial expressions or conversations close to the event that made it clear that the men were terrified or in awe as they write. As time went on, the event took a, a different level of significance, and the men involved became respected leaders of a fledgling Christian community. Perhaps relating their fear a little less became a little more acceptable. Luke's description of the men as almost overcome with sleep could also be a way of saying they were overwhelmed nearly to the point of loss of consciousness. If you think of the arrival of the Beatles at Shea Stadium, you'll remember the kind of, of reaction that people have in the presence of their most revered, iconic figures. Now what about that timing thing? Luke says it was eight days. Matthew and Mark say it was six days. It doesn't matter. It's roughly a week. It's not related to any particular prophecy about the Messiah. There is nothing especially urgent about the timeline. Luke may have been counting the day it happened, and the other guys may have only counted the days after it happened. It's not an event that could be corroborated by a whole bunch of people, since there were only three other folks there. Figuring the exact date is not a theological or historical meaning. It's roughly a week, give or take a day. It fits into the life of Jesus. Luke writes that after the event, the disciples were speechless and told no one. And both Matthew and Mark say Jesus told the disciples not to tell anyone what they witnessed. They seem kind of contradictory in the details, but they end up with the same result. The witnesses didn't tell anyone, at least not at the time. Eventually they told someone or we wouldn't know about it at all. Whatever the reason they didn't share the story right away, whether it was because they were speechless and just didn't have the words, or because Jesus told them not to, it's far less important than the fact that for a period of time, they kept the story to themselves. The differences between the accounts seem much larger than they really are. And sometimes we tend to get so caught up in minutia that we miss what's actually important in the message. 
And I'm reminded of this old thing that went around in teaching circles when I was in college. It goes like this. Jesus took his disciples up the mountain, and they ga he gathered them around him, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who suffer. When these ha things happen, rejoice, for your reward in heaven will be great. And Simon Peter said, Do we need to write this down? And Philip said, Is there going to be a test? And John said, Would you repeat that but go a little slower? And Andrew said, John the Baptist's disciples don't have to learn this stuff. And Matthew said, huh? And Judas said, what has this got to do with real life? And then one of the Pharisees, an expert in the law, said, I don't see any of this in your syllabus. Do you have a lesson plan? Where's the student guide? And will there be a follow-up assignment? And Thomas, who had missed the sermon completely, came to Jesus privately and said, did we do anything important today? And Jesus wept. It's a cute story, but it's also real. And it's not just in the teaching world. We like to pick apart the stories of Jesus. The world outside of, of churches likes to really pick apart the stories of Jesus and focus on all the details and seek these ways to kind of poke holes in the story and find reasons to pick and choose which parts to believe in and to decide we don't really have to do what Jesus said. It's way easier to dissect what Jesus said than it is to live by what Jesus said. But, as Christians, we need to accept the fact that these minor differences in how a story is told really don't matter. What matters is the impact of the story. Why is the story important? Well, for most of history of Christianity, people have highlighted the linking by Jesus of the law and the prophets in this moment, in the transfiguration. Jesus, who is the Messiah and the embodiment of the new covenant, was with Moses, who represents the law, all the law, and with Elijah, who represents all the prophets. And scholars have pointed out that this moment is where heaven and earth touch where human nature meets God, where Jesus bridges the gap between the things of the world and the things of eternity. And additionally, when we reflect on the miracles of Jesus, we can note that this is the only miracle story during his ministry. Remember, his baptism was before his ministry. That's what started him. This is the only miracle story during his ministry that happened to him instead of being engineered by him. In a timeline of important events in Jesus' adult life and ministry, the Transfiguration ranks among a handful of major notable events that include his baptism, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension. It's a milestone that marks his turn from earthly ministry to the impending death. The Transfiguration has links to other milestone events as well. The voice of God is heard by those who are there, and it echoes what was said at Jesus' baptism, this is my son whom I love, and it adds a new instruction. Listen to him. It has a connection to the ascension as Jesus is changed into glory, but in this life in the Transfiguration, in the ascension, he is changed into glory as he moves into heaven. The information about Peter desiring to build houses or tents for Jesus and Moses and Elijah to stay is echoed when Mary begs Jesus to stay with her in the garden after his resurrection. And since the story comes on the heels of Jesus predicting his death and telling the disciples about it, there is a tie also with the crucifixion. As pivotal a moment as the transfiguration is in the life of and ministry of Jesus, we don't learn about it right away. We're told in all of the accounts that it's not reported right away. That seems kind of counterintuitive to us. Why would God have the story wait? But there's a lesson for those of us who live today 
in a 24-hour news cycle and a world where people narrate every facet of their lives and the lives of everyone else around them via, via Facebook and Twitter and whatever those other things are. Perhaps God knew the world wasn't yet ready for that information. Maybe God knew there were more important tasks that needed to be done right now before the story was told. Maybe the witnesses needed some time to reflect on what they had seen and heard to be able to kind of wrap their brains around it as much as they could and put it into a larger context. Maybe Jesus used this secret keeping to prepare the disciples for the time after his death and resurrection that they would live under persecution, a time when telling what they knew without processing it first could be dangerous. Whatever God's reason for imposing a gag order, whether it come, came to the disciples from the words of Jesus or by being struck dumb with awe, the important thing to note is they did, in fact, wait for God's timing. They were faithful, and they held the story until the time was right to share it. When that time came, they didn't worry about what people would think of them for telling such a wild and unbelievable spiritual tale. They told the story of the event as it happened. We can learn much from the story of the Transfiguration, both the details and the discrepancies. We can learn to reflect on our spiritual experiences even before we share them. We can learn, or at least remember, that all the important parts of Jesus' life have direct connections, and that ours do, too. The important moments in our life have connections to other moments. And we can learn not to get bogged down in minutia so that we miss the greater lesson and amazing sights that are happening right around us. May God bless us all with the wisdom to learn the lessons rather than picking apart the details. And amen.